church it is good to be in the house of the Lord whether it is a physical house or it is a virtual house we are here together loving God and loving each other we are continuing in our journey with soul reset which is a theme of saying how do we get our souls closer to God and closer to each other We've been talking about spiritual practices, uh, that, which are basically ways that we can physically, spiritually, emotionally get closer to God. We've talked about the daily examine, where sometime during the day, you take a breath and a pause and say, okay, where am I with God? We talked last week about reading the Psalms, taking some time to look at the Psalms and say, hmm, let me read, today is the 24th, so maybe I should read the 24th Psalm. Or working your way through the Psalms, and again, using them as a devotional tool. Uh, this Sunday, we're going to be talking a little bit about the importance of taking a deep breath. In the midst of all that is going on politically, that is going on spiritually, that's just the daily uh, pieces of life that are difficult and challenging during uh, COVID-19. I think the idea of putting, taking a few minutes and getting our priorities in the best order is something that we can do. So we're going to talk about Mary and Martha today. And that is um, in the book of Luke, chapter 10, 38 through 42. But before we start examining that text... What I'd like us to do is to breathe in and breathe out. If you're sitting down, I'd invite you to get very, very comfortable. You know, both feet on the ground, maybe your hands in your lap, maybe your hands holding the someone of near you, and just relax. Be still and know that God is. Again, take deep breath, let it out. We gather together to seek comfort and peace. God is present with us now and always. We gather together for inspiration and guidance. The Spirit moves in us now and always. We gather together for encouragement and uplift. Jesus leads us together now and always. We gather in this virtual space knowing that God is with us in all places and all spaces. We come together to work our creator, redeemer, and sustainer now and always. And the people of God say, Amen. Now, it is Memorial Day weekend. And for many of us, this used to mean going to the lake, getting out the barbecue grill, uh, maybe going together, get with, together with family and friends. For some of us, it means on Monday you have a day off. But Memorial Day is more than that. It is a day to remember those who gave their lives for us in battle. I had someone recently say, Veterans Day is for those who uh, wore the uniform. Memorial Day is for those who never took the uniform off, who gave their lives for their country. So in the midst of whatever you're doing this weekend, I hope that you will remember that there are many of us 
who have family members and friends who gave their lives for their country. And that that is something that, to quote a scripture text, no greater love is than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Also, I do want to address one other thing that's happened recently. Um, on Friday, we had several different uh, political events happen. President Trump uh, urged all churches to be open. Uh, Governor Whitmer extended the stay at home till mid-June. And our bishop sent out a letter saying that each of us as pastors and churches are to consider what is safest and best for our own congregations. So we're going to be virtual at St. Paul's for a while. Our church council and our worship committee are looking at ways to safely open up the church building. I guess I struggle with the idea of the church being closed because the church is never closed. We who are followers of Jesus Christ are always here with Jesus. The building's closed, but the church isn't. So we will keep you advised on when the church building is going to be open. And we're trying to take steps to make sure that it is safe for everyone to come back and worship. So we're not we're going to be virtual for a while. But please know that our church administration and uh, myself and our worship committee are all working with CDC guidelines and with the direction of our bishop to make sure that when we do open up the building that everyone is safe and everyone can worship well. I'd like for us to pray together. And this is a called community prayer. And so what I'd like to be able to do is I will say a prayer and we'll have a pause in between. Again, a moment of quiet, a moment of reflection. So let us put ourselves in a comfortable place to pray. For some of us, that may mean closing our eyes. For some of us, it may be opening up our hands. Um, for some of us, it means standing. For others, it means sitting. But take a moment to get in your favorite prayer stance and let us pray. Holy One, Bridger of Distance, Connector of Beings, hear our prayer. In the midst of nonstop news stories about illness and scarcity, press conferences and cancellations, grant us quiet in our minds. In the midst of heightened anxiety about caregivers and caregiving, about health and hygiene, grant us calm in our hearts. In the midst of opposing views, open the doors or keep them closed. Reach out or hunker down. Grant us peace in our spirits. In the midst of distance in our families, our faith communities, in all of our relationships with others, grant us connection in our separation. In the midst of our Memorial Day weekend, let us remember those who served our, its country, our country in its hour of need, and especially for those who gave their lives in that service. In the midst of our lives, our gratitudes and concerns, our hopes and longings, give us a sense, an abiding sense of your comfort. And we claim that comfort with the prayer, great God, that you have taught us through Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And the people of God say, Our scripture reading, as I mentioned earlier, is from the book of Luke. It's chapter 10, 38 through 42. And for many of us, this may be a familiar story. We have Jesus and his disciples coming to Bethany, to Martha's house, to have dinner. And let us hear how things were going. While Jesus and his disciples were traveling, Jesus entered a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him as a guest. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his message. By contrast, Martha was preoccupied with getting everything ready for the meal. So Martha came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to prepare the table all by myself? Tell her to help me. The Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. One thing is necessary. Martha's chosen the better part, and it will not be taken away from her. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you are here with us in this spring morning. As I stand here in our sunroom here at the Parsonage. I hear the birds chirping. I hear a plane in the distance. It's peaceful. But we know, Lord, that you call us for not just physical peace, but inner peace. To make the first thing the best thing. So as we look at this text, Lord, Help us to be able to focus on you and to take this text to heart. And the people of God say, Amen. How many of us feel like we are busier than ever during this time of stay at home? Because it's a frightening time. We're in the middle of a worldwide pandemic with cities and even countries shutting down. In fact, this very week, I heard that Canada and the United States had both agreed to keep their borders totally closed, except for necessary trucks going back and forth, or necessary personnel. Things are shut down. And then others of us are kind of bracing for what's gonna come next, and all of us are listening reading headlines, and wondering what's going to happen next. And for some of us, the uncertainty concerning the, uh, COVID-19 is the hardest thing. One day you think maybe everything's going to open up. The next day, we hear no. We get conflicting messages from different political groups. We even get conflicting things from sometimes from medical groups because this virus is continually they're learning more about it so for one day they may say wipe down all your surfaces or like uh one what said this week that um you don't have to be so worried about that because it's airborne it's confusing it's scary and it makes it hard to figure out what is important and what's not now, Mary and Martha is a classic story. And uh, D. Mark Davis writes, an important interpretive question about this text is what exactly is Jesus addressing in his response to Martha? Because sometimes the story has been presented as uh, Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus and that's the most important thing. And that those who provide that gift of hospitality, of structure, of energy, are not that important. Um, Mary seems to be the ideal disciple 
because she spends time in devotion rather than in activity. And Martha seems to be a hysterical person who's just lost her way. And Jesus seems to be the person who takes all these provisions for granted. Um, Reverend Davis shares a story about a pastor who um, goes on and on and on about people working too hard and not taking time to God, but just to go home and sit down at a dinner without any real thought to his wife providing exactly what he needs when he needs it. And how much work did it go to get all that fried chicken on the table? Hospitality in Middle Eastern culture is a very, very important cultural norm. Um, I want us to think about it from a slightly different skew. To think about Martha and Mary as Martha not doing anything right and Mary not doing anything wrong. But to see that we need to think about this in terms of balance and in terms of priorities. Now, one of the things that my mother, bless, bless be, she just passed, would go absolutely bonkers over would be when my dad would come in, either at lunch or dinner, and say, I invited so-and-so to come and eat with us. We had five kids. And they, so mom had usually figured out exactly what she had in terms of provisions for five kids and a hungry farmer husband. And suddenly, one or two mouths to feed extra just threw her for a loop. And I can still remember her muttering in the kitchen sometimes, trying to figure out how she was going to stretch what she had. Some of us at, our, at St. Paul's, is, St. Paul's is well known for its hospitality. And I can imagine the ladies and men who are getting ready for funeral dinners, trying to count, head count, how many people are going to be there. And that I am quite sure there are last minute runs to the grocery store, picking up something extra so that everyone who come, came to a funeral dinner could be fed. So think about Martha. She has Jesus and his disciples coming to dinner. And she is trying to get everything ready. And, you know, uh, the language of this text kind of up, ups the volume a bit. She may be, <laughs> you know, if we actually had physically seen her, we may have seen someone in the middle of a panic attack. Um, not rooted in a chemical imbalance or, or, or a mental problem, but just overwhelmed by everything that's being expected of her right now. And especially with the cultural norms, hospitality is important. So she is sitting there, and she may be on the verge of losing it. She certainly sees what she's doing as a struggle, and she feels completely alone. We need to empathize with the general, this genuine challenge that Martha has in this situation. We don't want to dumb it down and pat Martha on the head and say, okay, you know, you just don't need to worry so much. I really think that we have to appreciate Martha's position before we critique her. She really is panicking about a lot of things. Jesus does not say, that she's irrational, or that she's wrong-headed. He just said that he's not going to stop Mary from sitting and hearing. The problem, I think, in this text that is presented to each of us is that when we are so distracted by the many that we lose our ability to appreciate and capture the one, the good part. Because I think what Mary and Martha's story captures is to understand priority. Sometimes, like Martha, I know I get caught up in the busyness of life and its motions. And we neglect to see the power of simply standing in the presence of God. The presence of God is what gives us the strength and the focus and the ability to accomplish a lot more than we can just on our own strength. Part of our soul reset 
is to learn the priority of things. Most importantly, not having to do everything because you have to, or no one else is going to do it. Writer Charles Hummel put together an essay that has become very powerful and popular among some people called The Tyranny of the Urgent versus the Important. The key to our soul reset is focusing on the things that are most important. Because some of us have discovered that sometimes what is really, really urgent to someone else may not be urgent to you. We are from the Wesleyan tradition. And one of the things that John Wesley did was he spent two hours in prayer every morning. And to me, that kind of blows my mind. Uh, that he could have that kind of concentration and focus. But someone asked him, why do you get up at four in the morning to pray when you have such a busy schedule? And he preached and he traveled and he was a great administrator and a good organizer. And he said, if I didn't have those two hours of prayer, I couldn't get anything else done. So I want us to think about Mary and Martha from the perspective of Jesus saying, you need to spend time with me first. There is nothing wrong with what Martha was doing. But Mary had chosen to take a few minutes to take a breath, to listen to the teacher who had come to her home. Take a deep breath each day sometimes each moment, and to know that with that taking of that breath, with that time each day, whatever time during the day or evening it works for you personally, to connect with God. Because if you are doing that, you will get the clarity of thought over time and over energy to be able to set your priorities, to be able to know that this is what God is calling me to do, and this can wait for a little while. Not because anybody else is pressuring you to do it, but because you know from your relationship with Jesus Christ that this is the important thing to do. Because the question that we always have is how do I decide what to do and what not to do. How do I know what to prioritize and what to let go of? If you're spending time with God on a regular basis, God will reveal to you the important things and free you up from being a servant of the urgent. It's the fuel for accomplishing things and living a life of significance. So what I would like to have you think about this week is where is your tyranny of the urgent? Sometimes it's self-created. I know that I worry about that myself and I have to work on that. But to think about, okay, what is God calling me to do this week? What is God calling for me to do today? And if you're working under that basis, then you can be sure-footed. You can say, yes, it is time to get the dinner done. Or, like my mother, you could say, okay, I've got extra dinner guests. But what's important is not so much the amount of the food, but the fact that we are welcoming people. And my husband trusts me to be able to provide. This week, in terms of spiritual practice, what I'd like for us to think about is to notice the presence of God in your everyday moments. To take time to have what our Christian Ed Director Alicia Cooley calls God sightings, where we see God in everything we do. To take time through your day just to take deep breaths. And also, 
in your schedule, even if it's only for five minutes, to have a regular time when you're listening to God. Maybe that will be during a walk. Maybe that'll be after the kids finally crash into bed. Maybe it will be in the early hours of the morning like John Wesley. I'm not suggesting that you spend off the bat two hours a day in prayer. I don't think I could do that. But I could do five minutes. So I ask you to try to see where God is in your everyday life. And like Mary, the best part is taking time to let your soul connect with God. And as you're doing that, everything else will fall into place. It'll be organized. It'll be done. And it will give you clarity of thought about what needs to be done and what can wait. On a Wednesday of this week, we will have again a time on um, Zoom where we will meet together and see how it is with your soul this week. I'll be putting a link into our Facebook page. And for those of you who are on our church's email list, that will also be going out as a reminder. So if you wish to join, it is um, a time uh, each week where you can say, how am I doing in my relationship with God? What are the challenges or the joys of the spiritual practice we're trying this week? So anyone can come, and uh, I'll be putting that link on Facebook uh, later today, and I'll be sending out an email through our email list. If you want to be on our email list, please um, put that in the uh, messages and comments, and Alicia Cooley, who is our Christian Ed Director, but is also our wonderful administrator for the Facebook page, uh, will be able to forward that and help you link up with that information. So at this point, I want us to think about where, what is our vision? Because what Jesus Christ says is that, to quote the old hymn, Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. If Jesus Christ is our vision, then everything else will fall into place. We will have that comfort and that stillness in the midst of life's storms and in the midst of the confusion and challenges of COVID-19. So our hymn, to, the closing hymn today is, again, Be Thou My Vision. Uh, it's an old Celtic song uh, with the tune of Slain. So for you music buffs, that's where that's from. Uh, the recording we're going to listen to and sing along, if you wish, is uh, a um, guitar piece, classical guitar piece, that he is singing along to. And it's B.J. Rourke is the gentleman who's playing it. We're also going to be singing four verses. If you're using the United Methodist hymnal, I think they've only got three. But we will be having four verses and I want you to think about, as you're singing this, as you're reading this, as you're listening to this, whatever's meaning coming to mean for meaning for you, what is your vision? Because Jesus wants to be yours.
Thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. <laughs> Bitches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only first in my heart. Heart King of heaven, thy treasure thou art. High King of heaven, my victory won. Heaven's joys overhead and sun Heart of my own heart One never before Still be my vision O ruler of all As we go our separate ways virtually, I want to thank you so much for being part of this service. And let us go with God's blessing. Gracious and loving God, thank you for the gift of your presence with us in our busy and hurried lives. Help us to slow down, give our burdens to Jesus, and live more fully in your presence through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the people of God say, Amen. Again, thank you for sharing this time of worship with us. May God keep you safe and healthy through the next hours, days, and weeks until we can gather again physically.